Good morning. Thank you, Chairs, Professor Debkota, Professor Tagashi. I take the privilege to thank the organizer for inviting me to join this very important conference. And uh, let me also thank and introduce my co-workers in this uh, presentation, me, Dr. Mario Garcia Podesta, originally from Peru. I think you will talking about the alpaca. But he is a colleague in the IAEA. And Professor Porker Singh Barr, a colleague working in Guru Ongar Dev Veterinary and Animal Science University in Ludhiana. OK, with this, let's save a time. So what I plan to do in this morning, that uh, let me share an quick outline with a couple of slides. I will share the buffalo population, production trend, and growth in the world. I would like to summarize that, uh, use a couple of slides to summarize the production system of buffalo across the world, focus on breeding and reproduction, especially the challenges we face in the smallholder and low input system. Then to focus a little bit on the health management because there has been a quite a few good papers already on cattle health and the buffalo health management practically does not differ that much. And then would like to highlight a few conclusions. Okay, this slide I'm sharing with you to show that the buffalo, the world buffalo population maintained a steady growth rate over the last 35 years. And today it is almost hitting to 200 million. And of course, the more than half of this buffalo or nearly half of this population belongs to India. And to see, to look at into the statistics in, from a different side, nearly 98% buffaloes are in Asia. So, and why, how these buffaloes are doing in, in reality? As you can say, over the last 35 years, it maintained a growth rate of 1.34%, which is very encouraging. But if you dig into the detail, this growth rate is mostly because of the river buffalo. Maybe I should clarify a little bit what is meant by river buffalo and swamp buffalo. I believe we all know, but just to refresh ourselves. Water buffalo are of two major kinds. The river, this classification is made depending on their wallowing habits. River buffaloes tend to wallow in fresh water, running water, so they are called the river buffalo, mostly found in South Asia and are dairy types. Swamp buffaloes, they wallow in more swamp, mud to cool them down, and they are mostly found in Southeast Asia. Maybe question arise, why do, need to, why do they need to wallow? Buffalo has a poor thermoregulatory system and very poor number of sweat glands. So to cool their body down, they need to wallow either in water or cold mud. Let's look at some macro figure. Today, world is hitting the something like 800 million tons of milk produced for our consumption. And look at the buffalo share. It's nearly 12%. So it's really a big share coming from the buffalo. The meat share is not that big, but you have to realize that when it comes from the milk, the major milk producers are cattle and buffalo. But when it comes from, for meat, of course, the range of animals are quite big. Again, the milk production, what is important to note in this slide, both buffalo numbers and milk productions have been growing, but you see the milk production growth was much faster and higher, indicating that it's not only the numbers are increasing, but also per buffalo productivity has increased, which is again a very good news. It maintained an average growth rate of 4%, but again, the major growth is coming from the river buffalo, and the stake for swamp buffalo is rather small. 
Same is uh, true for the uh, meat production. It looks like the, over the time, buffaloes are getting bigger and heavier. So the individual buffalo produce more meat. And to look at the macro figure, the buffalo maintained a, a growth rate of 2.5%. Again, it looks like the meat production is also higher in production. The growth rate is higher in the river buffalo. This means it's a very good candidate for a dual purpose animal of meat and milk production. Okay, having said that, let me summarize the world buffalo production system. Again, as we all know that uh, Asian livestock production is in the, mostly is in the hand of smallholders. And buffaloes are not an exception. They also are in the hands of smallholders. And the smallholders production system, the, usually the animals are kept in the backyard in a small shed. The number may vary from one to 20 or even in some cases a little more. These animals are taken to public, usually to public or community water bodies to drink, to allow them drink water and also to wallow. The feeding is mostly based on uh, crop residues but you'll also find that the farmers are cultivating tropical grasses, uh, cut and carry them to feed that. The concentrate in the small holders, you will see that mostly given to the lactating animals, and these are actually crop residues and milling byproduct. But there has also been several blocks, mineral blocks, urea molasses block, as a non-protein nitrogen supplement. The second one I give the name is a semi-intensive. It's not really intensive, but it's scaling up. You find this kind of farm in uh, South Asia a lot. Ideally, the major difference is that uh, they had a better shelter and the ventilation is uh, better. Feeding ingredient does not differ that much, but uh, it's more better planned, the feeding, and, and you get the feed around the year. This can be a good candidate for in starting the buffalo recording, which I will come later when I explain the breeding. And these are also very technology sensitive, so you can use uh, technology to scale it up and to the production. The third production system is a peri-urban and urban, mostly in big cities in India and Pakistan. The good thing is that City dwellers get fresh milk. The bad thing is that uh, there are reports saying that as high as 90% of the calves die in this farm. And of course, it produces a huge amount of waste that is the extra burden to the, uh, to the municipal corporation. So as you can see that uh, my comment that it, Although they get the most of the high producing buffaloes, but it's not very much contributing to the breeding program because the, the, the calf's uh, survival rate is low. And when these buffaloes are brought, they are bringing the very high genetic. But on the other hand, after one, two lactation, they're usually dry, in many cases not pregnant again, and sold for slaughter. So it's a kind of genetic erosion. The fourth one is an intensive uh, management system you find in uh, Europe, mostly in Italy, and in some of the Brazilian farm. They have adopted the production technology from the dairy cattle. It's very well set technology. Feeding is based on the TMR and specialized for lactating buffaloes, for dry buffaloes, for growing buffalo. Machine milking is in practice. Milk recording is very well set and they are regularly uh, uh, calculating or estimating the breeding value uh, for the sire. We also have some production in the silvopastoral system. As you know, that there are good and bad stories about silvopastoral, but it's more environment friendly, it's for uh, concerning the animal welfare. Animal loves to feed when they loves to feed, but they can also go to the shelter when the sun is too strong. 
With this, I would like to share the experience of joint FOIA division over the last 50 years. Again, as I said, the intensive system is well set, but I will summarize what we have been doing to support the member countries who have the smallholder and low input system. And uh, as you can see here, uh, we have been working, helping member states to identify lesser known and unconventional feeds to use feeding animals, to increase the efficiency of crop livestock production system, enhancing the laboratory capacity so they can analyze the feed, develop their own feeding database, make a feeding calendar to feed the animal around the year. We also work to help farmers to store their feed, especially the urea molasses mineral blocks is not only a low cost uh, non-nitrogen uh, supplement, but it can also be a good help during a catastrophe because it is, takes lesser st storing. All different kinds of treatment of the straw and we also work with the waste management and production of renewable energy. And we have a very successful project in El Salvador not from the buffalo, but from the cow manure, the, the, the electricity from the farm is going to the national grid. Coming to the breeding and reproduction, again, coming back to, so there are two different kinds of water buffalo, river type and swamp type, I already explained, but these buffaloes also differ in their number of chromosomes. River buffalo has 25 pairs of chromosomes, Swamp buffalo has 28 pairs. Interestingly, the crossbreeding is possible and the progenies are generally fertile, but there are few reports that uh, when they, you know that they will have 49 chromosomes, so is the, the one free chromosome, if it translocate on the sex chromosome, the animal is infertile. If it translocate on the somatic chromosome, then it's fine, the animal continue reproducing. It's not an exhaustive list of the breeds because uh, uh, but you will find that the Mora is the predominant breed and uh, similarly the Nilirabi, Nilirabi and, but these are good dairy breeds. Um, historically, the Mediterranean buffaloes are also migrated uh, from India. And then Brazil took buffaloes both from Mediterranean as well as from uh, Indian Mora. So they also claim to that there are Brazilian Mora and the swamp buffalo. Now, again, as I said, for the intensive system, the breeding system has been adopted from the dairy system and is rather well set, but in the light of the dairy. But we have challenges in the, in the smallholder and, uh, and low input system. Let me go quickly through a couple of these uh, challenges. In the whole Asia, if you see, the yard taking is almost lacking. And uh, there is not really a data system, although there are some recording, it's more projects and pilots. And the, another problem with the buffalo, the, the, in, the uptake of reproductive technology, especially artificial insemination, has remained very low, and I will come to that why. Few initiatives were taken to record, but it looks like these systems were mostly extrapolated from uh, intensive system, making a big burden from the, for the farmers, and farmers didn't find it realistic. Here I'm tempted to share some of the recommendations because we work with the developing country, not only the buffalo, but also with the other ruminants uh, and other animals, and the situation seems to be the, the same. My, our point is we do not need to record all farms and all animals, all the 200 million animals. We need to record some animals, a critical number that will give a sample size to select and a properly select sires to be used in the breeding. And then we can also agree to have more important and key traits, not all the traits, the traits that support the economy sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability. And then when the recording can be aligned together with other routing activities like 
uh, weaning, vaccination, slaughter of the animal. Other point is, I mean, in the intensive system, they have the luxury to get a record of the milk every day because they are using the milking machine. Maybe in the smallholder, one record, one month is enough, and we can use the cell phone and other, other uh, wireless technology to get this data. So these are some of the things that we should start thinking of. What is needed is a program and a policy, not the project and the ad hoc system. And it needs to strengthen the, the extension service using the farm data so farmers feel like they belong into the system. We are not talking about a system that worked very well in Europe, but I'm talking about farmers in India or, or Africa, but if, we ca if I can talk with his or her data, I believe the farmer will have a better, a better attention to my talk. And always to give a feedback system, because if the system doesn't have a feedback system, it's only one way flow of the information, farmer usually turn their back. That's what we can say from their experience. What I would like to make a cautious comment here, you see the economy has been growing in most of these Asian countries. So today's generation and university graduate will not be happy to rear two cows because he or she wants to see the bigger picture. They can make a bigger investment and get a bigger return. So we scientists have to bring technology that attract these young people so they come forward, they invest on the livestock industry. Otherwise, I think soon we'll have the problem. And this is what I say, that, okay, we have challenges, but we, we can also tackle them. We have the information and communication technology to capture data, to share data, to communicate faster. We know the reproductive, uh, assisted reproductive technology now, uh, and I will soon come to that. We have, uh, as you know, the, 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 it's called the genomic era. So the, uh, the whole genome of buffalo is already sequenced. So the several SNPs will be coming, describing different traits. Again, what is important, we need phenotypic data. We need data on the pedigree and the performance to be able to use this huge benefit of the genomic. Coming to the reproduction, you will hear all the negative stories of buffalo, because this is the kind of, most of the negatives that the people will talk, you will find the literature talking about late sexual motility, late sexual maturity, long postpartum anestras, estrus is not expressed, estrus sign is shown during the night time when farmer is sleeping, there are reports of seasonality, et cetera, et cetera. But if you analyze the cause, what is causing that? In most cases, it is the nutrition. I will come to that. Well, there also the buffalo lives in the, mostly in the, in the country where the temperature and humidity is high. Um, we cannot do many things immediately, but we can better plan. Daylight length, there are program of using daylight uh, manipulation. And, but I would like to really make a comment, although it is written at the last, but it's not the least, there has not been any selection of higher fertility in the buffalo. Like if you see, uh, mostly in the dairy cattle, there has been a continuous selection, and now the, the, even the sire selection criteria is very well set, uh, and that take care of fertility, although there is a catastrophe of fertility in Holstein. These two graphs are made from one of my students when I worked in Bangladesh, and uh, I found this interesting to share. Uh, on the left-hand side is the progesterone. Uh, the figures are in nanogram per ml, and on the right-hand side is the body condition score, uh, visually scored the animal. The cut point for progesterone concentration was one nanogram, meaning that animal in the fat-free milk. That always needs to be defined. So meaning that if a, uh, an animal was with uh, less than one nanogram progesterone, we assume that this animal didn't have any luteal activity. That means it never cycled. If the progesterone concentration was more than one, we believe that this animal started cyclicity. 
with this background information, you can see the, the animal on the top remain non-cyclic for a period of 150 days. No ovarian activity. But coming to the animal on the bottom, looks like the first ovulation took place around day 60. What is the difference? Well, when we talk about animal physiology, we cannot pick up one reason, but one evident reason is here is this animal kept on losing the body weight and it came down to 1.5. It's not a time for reproduction, it's a time for survival. But the animal below is not still a very fat animal, but maintained at the level of two and it continued the cyclicity. So, I'm tempted to conclude that, of course, we have all the uh, factors affecting the fertility of buffalo, but if we can improve the nutrition, and especially there's a lot of studies coming from Brazil and, and Italy, they are uh, supporting that if you can optimize the nutrition, you get the breeding, uh, you get the reproductive efficiency very close to dairy cow. Okay, now coming, I will be uh, summarizing the information on the, on the uh, reproductive technology. AI has not been used that much. The reason is the buffalo cannot be detected in astras. Thanks to the good works over the last more than 50 years, now we understand the luteal function, we understand the follicular waves, we understand the hormonal profile during the uh, estrus cycle. So going very quickly, well, I have just reviewed the, uh, quite a good number of literature. You will come to that. Details are in the, in the proceeding. And, but try to make some summary a little bit too simplified, but maybe just to have a better discussion on that. Early 80s, we used to palpate a cow, identify the corpus luteum, and use a prostaglandin. Usually the cow was in estrus between two and four days and we inseminate it. But it doesn't help in the buffalo because the problem is the heat detection. So then it looks like the second protocol works better. We can use two prostaglandin at an interval of 10 to 12 days, and whether buffalo shows estrus or not shows estrus, we still inseminate them at day 70 and 90. The results was good, but not as good as we expected. So other modification came that we can use uh, uh, a GNRS first to ensure that the luteal function was there. We used uh, prostaglandin to, to regress the uh, corpus luteum, and then we use another GNRS to ensure the ovulation, and this time you can reduce one insemination and also tighten the synchronization time. People also call it an ovulation synchronization. But again, you see, every modification we make, we are adding another hormone, and the cost goes to the smallholder farmers. We also have to realize how much they would like to afford. The other procedure is based on the progesterone, but it's the same principle. We increase, we make an artificial luteal phase, we withdraw the progesterone device, use a prostaglandin to regress the pro uh, progesterone, and then uh, there are protocols using the equine chorionic gonadotropin to ensure the follicular growth. The risk is that you might get a twin. The people will be arguing that they can use the thin cows, they can use early postpartum cows, they can use uh, heifers which are grown up but not still start a cycle, cycling. I will be a little bit cautious to use the thin cow. If it is the case, I will first work on the nutrition and then go to use the expensive hormone. That's my experience. Similarly, we can use more hormones to tighten the synchronization time and make the um, insemination in a, in a shorter time. The result of this, as you can see, I'm not going to read out, but you can see the number of hormones people used a variable numbers, but then the conception rate, sorry, uh, uh, the conception rate, lowest found 28% and uh, highest found 
85 percent, but I will make a cautious conclusion on this study. This is not an exhausted uh, review, but you find more review in the, in the proceeding. Except these first two papers, they used more than 1,000 animals. So whatever conclusions they made, I have more confidence because calculation of a conception rate with uh, less than, uh, with 100 animals, 50 animals, is not a real conception rate. We need a minimum of around 500 animals to make a valid conclusion on the conception rate. So this is a weak point in, in all the technology reports we are getting. Okay, I would like to share this slide. The data here, you see, it came from more than 8,000 animals from 14 countries, seven Latin American and seven Asians. The three tools were used in the study. One was the progesterone analysis on the day of insemination, on uh, day 10, 12, and on day 20, 24. We all know the rationale, and I will explain in a, in a sub second slide. The second tool was the, all the cows inseminated were diagnosed per rectal for positive or negative pregnancy, and we used a computerized database to keep the records. So, what we see, seven, more than 17 percent animals were inseminated when they were not at all in heat. They were either acyclic or in a luteal phase, and we never expect to in conceive this animal. And then you can see the another 37 percent is also not a very real efficiency. So what I am trying to make a conclusion here is not the physiology of the cow. It's not only the quality of the semen, it's not the skill of the inseminator to put the semen in the body of the uterus of a cow. There are factors behind. It's the efficiency of the total system. In the cattle, there has been data from thousands or hundreds of thousands of animals, but in buffalo, we are still missing data like this, a reasonable number. We need to share our experience. We need to collaborate to generate more data so we can make a valid con conclusion. Just to explain to you the, how does it work, on the day zero, we are expecting, uh, if the cow is in estrus, we are for sure expecting a low level of progesterone. On day 10, uh, we are expecting a high level of progesterone. If we get a low level of progesterone, we make sure that this cow was not in estrus. It was an acyclic cow and wrongly inseminated. On day 2024, 20, again, if the cow is not conceived, we expect a low level of progesterone. 100% negative pregnancy diagnosis is a very good side finding from this exercise. If there are high level of progesterone, of course, we are not sure, but it's likely that the cow is pregnant. Why I say likely? Because the, the, the progesterone is a cow hormone. We all know it has nothing to do with the viable fetus. So, Apparently, it has a viable corpus luteum, so animal is likely to be pregnant. Excuse me. But we also found animals inseminated with a high level progesterone here, high level progesterone here, high level progesterone here. About 5% animals were inseminated when they were really pregnant. So all these wrongdoings are there. What I am saying, I will leave this slide soon. This is a very good tool. It can also be tested in buffalo, but we have to make sure in cattle, we, we don't find a report saying that the extra cycle length goes beyond 24 days. But in buffalo, there are good proportion of buffalo. The extra cycle is extended beyond 20, up to 26 days, which we need to figure out before we can use the technology. With the health management, as I already mentioned, the buffalo seems to share all the diseases that the cow has. And apparently, veterinarians are also using the same approach of treating the buffaloes or preventing buffalo diseases as they use for the cattle. So I will leave this one quickly because there has been a very good number of papers on FMD, heart health, and two very good papers on, on uh, oral health, which I will refer to. But what I do want to discuss how to reach the smallholders and low input system, especially for the preventive and hard health practices. 
we have an experience of working in Bangladesh during 2001 and 2010. What we use, we use the four forms. One is the, for uh, inventory, preventive health, and nutrition management, for reproduction management, oral health management, and general health management. Again, it's nothing special. Everyone would use that. But how to go use that in the smallholder system? We use the community-based approach. I promise it's not as complicated as this figure looks. Let me summarize. The key or the difference, key difference were that first we talked to the farmer, we took them on board, we explained to them, we empowered them, and we interacted and we agreed what would work in his or her farm and what will not work. That was the first thing. So we agreed. We had the challenge to recover the cost and how to overcome. We both agreed that, okay, the cost can be recovered di indirectly from the uh, milk buyer. So meaning that we have to organize the farmers into groups and associations. So the, all of them sell milk to a buyer and the buyer pays the, the preventive veterinary cost. And that worked very well in an in a, uh, association of 3,000 farmers. And I think uh, where there is a scope to organize farmers into associations of any kind, whatever fits in this country, especially in the smallholder, we can apply. In this case, hard will be the whole community, not only one, one farm. We can discuss more on that. With the calf health, if you see the cause, Again, its cause is nothing different. It's the same cause we found in, in uh, cattle calves as well. But what is the different is to realize that today's calves is tomorrow's cow, which unfortunately is not happening in the smallholders and low input system. And it's understandable because the farmers is under heavy pressure because uh, cow is not, calf is not the productive animal. It's the productive animal is the cow. So feed cow, get more milk and sell the milk so the calf doesn't get the milk. And calf is also given the worst place in the farm. You have seen one of the photographs where it's, a, it is a, it's overcrowded. They are with the, with the adult animals, often injured by them. So quickly to some of the experience to share on that, we need to have an individual pen housing for the calves. If we, I mean, it's not, there is no other option. We have to let this calf survive and do better. I would like to share a very small experience we had with the naval infection. It's, it used to be a worse situation in Bangladesh with these 3,000 farmers I was talking about. Simple technology. Within 24 hours of birth, we just used the uh, iodine as an antiseptic on the naval and the, the, the incidence of this uh, naval ill got very low. And the other technique we used to make a platform so the cups are not laying on the mud, they could lay on a wooden plat uh, platform. So these two simple technology help reducing the naval ill. I'm talking about simple, affordable technology that the smallholders can add up. Colostum feeding, almost everyone knows, but not paying the attention and also we need to explain to the farmer that you need to have this calf feed whole milk before its rumen develop. And it needs to be explained to the farmer what is the difference between the rumen or not having a rumen. Otherwise, they, want, they, they believe that the mother can feed on the forage, why not the calf? This needs to be explained. It needs to be explained the, how the calves behave. Normally, the literature says that and also from the experience that buffalo calves suckle more frequently than the cattle calf. So if you are using a hand feeding, we have to keep that in mind. Okay, the time is running. Let me draw a few conclusions. I think we all agree that the buffalo provides subsistence income and protein to millions of people in the, in the, in the world. It still provides the drop power and rural transport, but I would also be cautious with the economic development and mechanization, the buffalo's use in the, in the transportation and agricultural drought will be rapidly sinking. Already the symptoms is shown by the swamp buffalo. 
So we have to bring more technology. How to use swam buffalo in a more productive form? I said already that the, the, the genetic selection is very poor. The genetics is the foundation for all livestock industry. If we cannot make good use, the things will not progress. And for that, we need information, we need records on the pedigree, we need, we need records on performance, and uh, there is no other alternative. I mean, we cannot jump. And as I said already, we need to think of a potential technology-driven beef industry that can easily grow, taking into the consideration of the swamp buffalo. Again, the swamp buffalo use in agriculture and rural transport will soon shrink. We have to find technology how to use this animal more properly for human being. We need the R&D technology to validate, especially the feeding. This is a chaotic situation for the smallholder. We go to a farm, we advise you feed 10 kilos of concentrate, 10 kilos of hay, and five kilos of straw. We never think that for two animals, this guy needs to go in five places. With this, it would be good to have a, 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 a total mixed ration, a dry matter of 15 to 18 kilogram, so the farmer can buy it and and give it to the cow and then uh, he's better off because it's two cow he, or she doesn't need to spend the whole day with these two cow, can do something else. So this is an area where we can make, the scientific community can make a very big change. Until now, the cement preservation and breeding soundness evaluation is just extrapolating the protocol from the bull. The buffalo can have differences. And uh, so it needs more studies. So what is the difference? What should be the, is there a different cement protocol will preserve cement in a, in a better quality with a better fertilizing capacity? Same is true with the extra synchronization. It works, but you have seen how complicated the things are and the, how variable the results are. We have the opportunity to use the genomics, but before that, we need the phenotypic data, we need the performance and pedigree data to be used, to be able to use that. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience hearing. Uh, and I will be happy to address a couple of questions if the chairs allow. Thank you.